Okay, so here's what we're gonna be working on today. I've got it up on screen here. I have, uh, I've spent yesterday kind of experimenting around with ideas about how I want to change the way I model the story graphs in the story engine. So if you're watching this and you want to be able to follow along, I'm gonna give you a, a quick, but maybe not super complete idea of exactly what transition I'm trying to make. So I have these old styles of story graphs that look like this, and these are up and running, these work, where I, I declare a bunch of states, I declare paths by, by um, connecting an uh, initial state to a final state like this, and I attach one of these um, path code values onto each path to give it like an integer uh, code that I can use to pick out different paths that flow between states. And the point is that the whole graph, when you walk around in it, that's the story. And then they have things like they have these rule things. So like you can attach um, string data. So if we look at like QUS intro, it's like the intro to the game is written here and the styles and the interactivity is all attached here. And um, you can see we have things like this push, which pushes on a different graph, right? So I can have more than one of these graphs interconnected in, in interesting ways to make it more than just a graph walk, but it, but like, you know, nested graphs or interconnected graphs and, and simultaneous graphs and stuff. These are things which are in the vision. Right now, all I can really do with multiple graphs is I can take one of them and push one onto the stack. And you can think of it like going into a different graph. And when you leave that graph you went into, you come back to the one you started from. And so you can stack those up and, and make more complex graphs by stitching pieces together. Um, and then if we keep going, there's like the uh, evening graph is the most complicated. Here we start seeing like lots of game rules being implemented inside of the states. And the game rules are essentially a VM. Okay, so if I run this, oh, I have a few things have been renamed. Let me fix that. There we go, okay. So if I run it, you can see we play the game. Looks like it's looked for a while. You uh, uh, you can ignore this like debug readout down here, but otherwise, you know, you walk around, you make decisions about how you want the story to proceed. And, and so on, right? Um, so that's, that's all working and if we look i sh do i have i don't have let me show you so we can like enable logging and when we go through the story now you know we um get to the end of the story somehow. And then uh, what happens is we can see this huge, and you know this might not be super obvious what you're looking at here, and a lot of it's not the most helpful, but this huge log of everything the VM did during that run. It's all right here.
and there's weird stuff here like these are looking at the uh, this is the look ahead it's getting repeated a bunch um, I'm gonna actually go and take some of that out because it's kind of not real at this point so if you look at the look ahead that's getting called right here just take that out All right so if I play that the extra text at the bottom is gone Okay, and we can see the uh, the log is a little less chaotic. There's not these big blocks of repeating nonsense because the VM isn't being run every frame now. It's only being run on when I click. When it's doing look ahead, it runs every frame, which doesn't need to be doing, but it's just sort of lazy and hacked in. So that's how, how it all works right now. And I'm kind of in the middle of transitioning to a new, uh, so to some new ideas. Uh, so the new ideas look more like this. So I put all of them into one big story map. And so I have a lot more smaller graphs than I did before because it was kind of a pain in the butt to have separate files for each one. So I'm hoping one thing that'll be nicer here is I have my graphs can be nice and small as I'm iterating on them. Uh, I'm still hacking it together. Like I'd someday love to have a visual editor for this, but uh, I'm trying to figure out how I can, well, there are two problems to solve. One, I need to make my interface while I'm prototyping a little nicer. And I think this is a step towards a nicer interface. Uh, I'm doing this weird blue, you know, the, uh, the comments here, just because if I'm in four coder and I don't have a comment at the beginning, then I can't put spaces in there and I can't turn off virtual white space for just one file. So this is just the easiest way for me to make it lay out correctly uh, in a readable way for me. It's a little funny looking, but um, that's what I ended up with. I could just not make this a C file. I could make it a separate text file and parse it or something like that, but I'm trying to avoid needing to write a whole separate parser and just deal with it at that level. Um, and I'm finding, I think I'm, I'm, I think I've set up a way here where I can do macros to to spec out the format still and, and make progress without getting bogged down in a whole separate parsing system. So the macros uh, are defined over here and I haven't actually built the function they're based on yet. So that's what I'm gonna be doing today. And just to give an idea of what the macros are doing, um, they are forming like a tree of what I call cells. So we have these S cells and this S map which S is short for story, right? So the S map is filled up with S cells. The S cells form a tree. And then there are different kinds of S cells, which we see here. So there's global ones, which create the things underneath the global cells are like variables can be there. And then there are graphs, which are also at the level zero. So I can, I can have global variables like spread around by going like this. You know. In room rooms available or whatever right if I wanted to if I wanted to keep track of how many rooms are available in the inn I could do it like this and then similarly I've got gra uh, graphs are at the level zero so what this level tells you is there can only be um, like if I if I make a graph here then the things that show up underneath that are now going into the under, there's now are, these are all children or, or and descendants of the graph node and not the global node, but these are all descendants of the global node. And the reason these are descendants of the global node, but this is not a descendant of the global node is because variable has a priority level of three. So it's higher, it can go, it, it attaches to things that with a priority of two, one or zero that can't come before it, right? And it attaches to the most recent thing that's either a two, one or zero. So a variable can go here but the idea is like I can also look ahead here and we'll see like I have variables under graphs. So a variable doesn't have to go into the global, it can go there, but it can also go under an initial. An initial has a, 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 a one here instead of a zero. So this variable attaches to this initial. These things always attach to the most recent node of a higher, of like a, of a higher priority. By higher priority, I mean a lower number here. The zero is the highest priority and the, bigger numbers stand for lower priority. So low priority things attached to the nearest 
make their they make their parents the nearest node of a higher priority that go, like uh, when you when you go back in time okay so that's how that we're i'm hacking this together to put together a tree and uh, i need to go and implement this today and then if that gets done uh let me let me start putting this into a to-do list here um i'm gonna put this here so i initially had some ideas we're gonna get rid of this and instead say all right step one is we want to form the cell structure or define define the cell structure um, construct the cell structure let's call it that and then we want to uh, if we get that done once I've got the cell structure I want to process that into a graph And so I can talk more about how that would need to get done later if we get this first part done. So the first step is to um, yeah, the first step is to build the SNAP and SL structure and the SL function that that's going to gather these up. And once we have a cell structure, we can uh, we can talk about how these things here will map onto a graph that I actually want to convert it to. Or, alternatively, what we could do is we could uh, we could build uh, an interpreter on the cell structure directly. So instead of taking the cell structure and then converting it into a graph inside my virtual machine, I could also just build an interpreter that runs right on the cell structure. The advantage to that would be that I could get to the point of testing out the features and seeing what it feels like to program with them quicker. Maybe it might be uh, it might be easier to construct and iterate on the features that way early on, but it would also one it would cap out on a certain level of complexity and also it would uh, run a lot slower than than a processed version. <sighs> but you know what? I think it's the right thing to do that first. Now that I think about it. Because um, this is still very early. I'm still in this phase of trying to figure out the best high-level model. Right? So I, I spent some time playing with the, the graph, and I ended up turning it into a VM. And so that kind of gave me a clue that you know, it, it was a little hard to program with it in the end. But there were still aspects of the graph that, that feel like the magic lives there. And so I don't want to, I, I don't want to continue with the graph VM directly. I want to see if I can come up with a high level way to use the graph. Um, and so I'm kind of iterating on, on that. And I think it makes more sense to iterate on the, the semantics of that than the, the, the algorithms that optimize it for execution speed and for and for you know being able to get make it a lot and it, at some point I'm gonna want to make it so big that having it boiled down to something smaller and faster will matter but I'd want to get the semantics I want, I want to iterate on those semantics more and I think that this would let me do that sooner so let's try to go for this right now so we have story map with the story maps thing. This defines the story maps. We have the story macros. These set up the macros for building the story maps. Um, I want to rename this file. Well, why don't we call, yeah, I'm trying to think of like what to call the new file that's going to contain the story cell, story map structure. Maybe I'll just call it story cells uh, to get started. Does that work? 
Yeah, that works. Okay. So. Uh, first things first, I have this I have these various um, kinds here. I'll start with null graph initial terminal state show subgraph path for mark variable wire gate cost const expression. Okay. Now I'm taking a look at this, I'm thinking, do I want I want to make the, like I actually want to re rearrange this just a little bit to make it fit my naming my typical naming scheme. Super feeling the music I've got right now. I'm gonna try something different. Uh, something like There we go. Okay. This is this is a, a particular phase. I don't know if anyone else has this experience, but when I'm programming, I can sort of get a sense for what kind of programming I'm doing and what mood that makes and that different forms of background music seem to create the right space or the right amount of energy for it. And this is a case where I need very little energy. This is all very rote but I need clear focus and lots of energy. I don't need a lot of space. I don't know if I said I need low space. I need lots of energy in order to get a lot done. I don't need to think a lot. I've kind of already got an idea for this in my head. I was kind of trying to avoid using the name kind here just to make it shorter. And I don't know why now that I think about it. It's not like this is uh, something that's like overwhelmingly common that I'm gonna have to type it out so much that it hurts. So just stick to the usual formula, you know. <sighs> um, okay, these are forming trees, so I want a next, I want, whoops, a first and a last. I'll call that first child and last child. Throw in a child count. I shouldn't need a parent in this case because I'm not editing it or um, uh, doing other things where I would need to walk up the path. There, the trees define themselves locally I think I think that will be true I don't think I will need to be able to say hey given this cell that you've stored take me back to the graph associated with it as I'm saying that I'm just thinking they're, they're like they're it's not super likely but it'll be easier to build it in up front and there's like some ways that could happen like if I want to use a pointer to a variable cell as a way to mark that I'm Edit, talking about that cell but then later I'm 
curious about something like where are all the references to this variable within its scope, then I'm going to want to know what scope it's in, and that's by going to its parent. So, so yeah, I can see, well, I'm not convinced I actually do need that. I, I can see how it would be a little premature to rule it out, and it's easier to build it in now while I'm building the structure. So let's go for that. Um, we don't need this inside the cell. That's a part of the construction process, but we need these. So those are uh, basically a void pointer will do. Um, most of the time that's going to be a C string literal that we might want to process into a name, right? So we'll also put this on there. If, uh, if we're building something that takes a yeah, why don't we do this? So the the name field goes there on the first lot, and the the pointer goes there. Um, show yes, yeah, so that's an example of a pointer, not a name. Um, that's not a name, but we're calling that the string. So that does go there. That goes there. This one is some data, not a name. It's just an integer constant. And that one, similarly, is a string. OK. So that's what a cell will look like. Now, I want to build this. Uh, I'm calling it smap right there. I think I'm going to rename that to like the s. Um, builder or something like that. Con constructor. Context. Loose. Cons. I'll go with SC cons. So the constructor provides an arena and it provides a set of set of active cells and let's see we need one for each of these slots so we have one two three four five slots and we'll also have a root okay now the way the API will need to work Construction types, construction functions. Okay, so we need one function And then we construct a cell by giving it the cons, the cell kind, the priority, 
a C string and a pointer. Okay. Yeah, I think that's everything we need there. So now we need to implement that. Makes me think I also probably want a root cell type. So root will just be put to have that kind there. Now, when we make a new cell, um, The priority that we give that cell should be less than, sh sh should be an index into the active cells array. And then what happens is if it's a priority zero, we're going to attach it to the root. Otherwise, the parent co is ba found by looking at priority minus one in the array. Yeah. So the parent starts off as a root by default, and then if priority is greater than zero, the parent becomes the active cell at priority minus one. And then what we do is we construct the new cell. the new cell gets pushed onto the parents length list. The cell knows its parent. And so that sets all of, that updates this for the parent, that updates these for the, ch uh, the new cell. That's updated for the parent. Okay. The new cell gets its kind. It gets its string from the C string, if the C string isn't null. And it gets its pointer. And then Finally, we need to update the active cells. So we start from priority and we go to the end of the array. And we write cons active cells i equals the new cell. So what this means is if I put in a cell of zero, like a, if I put in a cell at priority level zero, then all of the spots from zero down get filled. That way, if someone makes a cell of priority three next, it'll go in there, slot three will be pointing to the cell of priority zero I just made, and so the cell of priority three that comes after the cell of priority zero becomes a child of that directly. And you might be thinking, shouldn't the cell of priority three be attached to a cell of priority two and no the idea is a cell of priority three the, the rules about who can be whose child are a little more flexible than that it's you can some a, a certain cell can be an, a, another cell's child but the 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 priority is for constructing which things um which things sort of start newer precedence levels or newer groups um within the system that way i can do it all without delimiters um, if 
for now. The only place where that doesn't work is if I wanted full on expressions, which is why if you look at my system here, when I do have the concept of an expression show up, I escape out to a string literal. And the idea is eventually I'll maybe need to write a, a, a little expression parser for those. Uh, we won't probably get to that today, although it's not out of the question. Um, it's not really uh, the biggest priority yet. The, um, the rest of the system though is all structuring like the same way that, you know, we have functions and statements inside of them. Uh, but I guess again, statements can go inside of statements. None of this has that like recursive property. Uh, it's all d sort of fixed mode declarative, but there are things like variables that can shift from global to graph to state level uh, declarations. So that's why I have that flexibility and the depths thing set up. Okay, so that should be the right thing. If I haven't got any bugs here, that should be the right thing for um, uh, implementing the macros. So the next big step is to put together the, the map declarations on the left panel here with the story cell constructor, you know, a single function that'll actually plug these in and run the constructor, run this these macros as constructors. And that way I will actually have the cell tree. So let's go and plug all that in over here. Um, yeah, so Let's say we want story cells dot h, we want story cells dot c, and then we want a function we want a function that would um, run the construction of the story cells. So I think the way we can do that is we're going to want to include the story macros to define the macros. There, so those get defined and then we want to Hi, Sherlock. I don't actually have, I don't, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't have a typo. You made me think I had a typo with your comment. Um, uh, okay, so I need to set up the constructor. And then Oops, that's a typo. Uh, set up the constructor, begin that constructor by attaching it to the run arena. And then, yeah, let's see, at the end here, we just want to grab the, the root. We'll call this the story root, I guess. No, yeah, I get it now. For some reason, I thought that the, because I have somewhere like right here, construction, yeah, like cell construction, I don't know. I, I figured I must have typed that in when you made the comment. I uh, I understand though what happened. So, so finally I include the story map. The story map contains these. So the macros turn these little statements into function calls to the cell constructor, which will then build all that out. And finally, we can set the story root equal to the thing called root in the constructor struct at the end. 
const macro redefinition. Ah, too bad. Okay. So what I might need to do then is just give this a different name. Let's call it expert const or something like that, or v const and v expert, something like that. Just a uh, const is just a um, helper so that I can put c constants as values in where our, uh, wherever I need to compute a value and expert is another place where I can, another way to put in a value. So the V stands for value. Right, the cons I made is not a struct or a pointer, it's a struct. So let's do that. Right, and these don't come with semicolons in the map, so we put them in the macros. Not putting them in the map is on, on purpose in this case, because I'm trying to, whoops, I'm trying to make them uh, It's on purpose because I'm trying to make them as tight as possible so I can fit a lot of these onto the screen. You know, I have spots where I have like three of them in a row uh, on a single line and stuff. Another three. All right. Um, so let's see. What are these things that aren't working? So, yeah, some of the, in some of the spots here, I proposed that I had content I don't actually have, but we can go and fix that. Just some filler stuff to get the new system up and running. So there we go, there's end. That's how the game ends. Um, I want it to be, can I grab the align? I don't have that here. Paragraph align. So that is like centered the end. Subgraph morning. Is subgraph set up the wrong way? It should just be taking a string. Sherlock 93 does includes in the middle of the files cause you any pain in management. Um, I'm trying to think of how to, how to talk about this. The, so I don't like having to do this sort of thing here. This is not um, an ideal way to write code but it is a very handy tool for fast iteration when I am experimenting. So if I find what I'm looking for, I would then, the next step I would take would be to find a way to get it without having to do this. But while I am in this exploratory mode, this is actually very, very convenient. So it's not, the reason I wouldn't like this in a long-term setting is because it degrades reusability a little bit in the sense that if I like the idea, for instance, of my story map, then then this is not the right format for creating them because now the only way to use them is to send it through a C preprocessor and a C compiler. Um, so yeah, ultimately I don't like these because this is this is a this is a way to turn the C preprocessor and the C language into a an editor for a data structure. 
where ultimately you wouldn't want to have to edit the data structure this way and you wouldn't want this to be the interface for plugging this in. But while I am looking for the data structure that has the best properties for what I'm doing, uh, I love it. Like I really like using X lists and macro tricks. I've gotten, I've gotten comfortable with using that. It's just not a good long-term plan. It's, it's a great, it's a great iterative iteration help aid though for like explorative stuff. Why is this having a problem? Is this misspelled? Yes, it is. So I gotta just fill in some of these this bit little bits of content here and there where I I, I set the system up differently initially. And um, and so things are not or like I, I have to transition to the new organization to make make it fit the I have to I have to write the new content that, that matches better the way the new system is organized. So yeah. Um, each of these needs to exist. Okay, so those are done. Those are done. Probably all of those should look like this. Probably. Maybe they don't need the page break. That might be something I end up automating. I kind of imagine so, but um, not an issue yet. All right, Tavern Social is a new name for this. Uh, right, function. Do I even have that as a macro? No. So the function would kind of live at the same layer as any, a function would be something I could attach to a state or to a path. Yeah, so it's one of these. Um, mark. Right, like that. And we would put, we would put it in like this. Cool, uh, see you later, Sherlock. All right, um, now still, it's gonna find that that function doesn't exist, and I can't actually write that yet, so I'm gonna comment that out. That is an important part of the system, but it's a little bit more advanced, and I don't have this function or quite the right amount of context to plug that in yet and define how that's gonna work. 
All right, so in arrive needs to get renamed. In stay needs to get renamed. So these are the macros that go through the the old graph system, and those also have state and path. So that's going to collide with the state and path I have up here. But that's fine. What I can do is I can say after this we don't actually need any of those. So any of them that are a problem, we can just drop them. And then some of the old stuff is still connected with things I just changed. So let me check those out. Okay. So, uh, where does that put us? I want to see if the story cell tree uh, is in good shape after that. Um, let's attach it like this. Yeah, that's fine. I'll live with it. Um, fat. Okay, so I've got it in my game state. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just add a new function here to the story cell system for logging. Uh, that can look like this. So dump. It'll take an arena and a cell and an indent level and an output string list. Okay, so the cell kinds I'm going to turn into an X list. So now it can look like this. And that way I can do
Okay. So that gives us a way to take in a cell kind and get its string. So we can use that here. All right. And then these cells also have string in that. So if, uh, if I understand correctly, what I want to do now is I want to uh, push F, there we go. And what is exactly the order on this? We want to do the arena, the list, the string format, and then the parameters. Okay. So we're going to do um, some amount of spaces here for the indent. So for that, I put the indent, and then let's see, two, four, 8, 16, 32 spaces should be more than enough to cover any indent that I actually want to have to read. And then, uh, let's see, we want a new line at the end. We want the kind string. So that gives us what kind of cell we're looking at. And then the other bits here are, do I want, um, oops, my caps lock is on. I want um, the label text, so that'll look like, uh, this is where it gets interesting. Do I want this all in one go? No, not exactly. I want that to get started and then if the cell string is not an empty string, then we're going to put in a space. And the label here will be like this. And we'll expand the cell's string like that. And then if the cell's putter is not null, we'll again go, hey, print out that for us. Okay, so that should, that should be good. And then I can do a new line. Okay, so that gives us the indentation, the kind of cell, the probably want to have a default here of like error mode or something. And then uh, the text on the cell, the pointer data on the cell. Do I actually want to print the putter data? Is that going to do me any good? I think more likely it would just be useful to go like this, right? like putter or something. And then a new line, and then I need to iterate, like I need to recurse, right? So we look at the children. All right, so each of those jump drops out a line. Right here we go dump string. Do we have scratch sitting around here? No. Um, let's just get a scratch. onto the scratch arena, take a look at the story route, start with an indent of zero, 
and put it into the dump string. And then we'll just actually write that out, right? Like f write uh, dump string string one dump string size standard out. Oh, dumpster is a is a string list. At that log we just created. Um, graph game has an initial state with the name intro. It's got something to show and then path to these states. Another state. Player character. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Town arrive. Show this. Go to evening one. Evening one, go to subgraph evening, path sleep one A with a mark sleep, so path night one with mark night. Good, good, good. Graph dawn, morning, afternoon, evening. Evening can go to tavern in or camp. Tavern goes to subgraph tavern. In goes to subgraph in with path to tavern and a path to sleep. State goes to camp. And there's the log. So let's let's um, turn off the log of the old machine. Our next step here is actually going to be to just gut the old machine entirely. So that stuff's out to go. But it looks like the uh, the cell tree is coming out correctly. So story cells. Um, I think I put this over here in the story machine. Let's move these to dos over closer to where they are being applied. Okay. I think that's a good spot to commit. Very good. Okay. Now we could go straight into trying to build the interpreter for it. Uh, that could be doable. We could also uh, get our get our feet wet with um, looking at the structure by putting a, some checks in there. So let me show you. Like, I definitely want checks sooner or later. So let's put this on the to do list here. Cell structure checks. So the basic checks I can do look like this. Um, let's see. Uh, underneath the global scopes, only variables should show up. That's the only thing that's legal so far. Under graph scopes, we should only see states and variables. Initial and terminal are special kinds of states. No path should go into an initial state. No path should come out of a terminal state. Uh, a more complex kind of check, let me start writing these down. So paths never enter into an initial or leave a terminal. More complexly here at the, well this, yeah, I can't, I can't put this under the concept of cell structure check. I would need a graph structure to do this part, but I wanna make sure that if you, 
starting every state that it, every state should have a path to some terminal and um, these should be DAGs. That is, there shouldn't be any cycles in the graphs formed by these. Let's see. But that's gra that's that graph stuff I don't want to put into this level of analysis. Um, Uh, we would need things like name collisions, globals and or variables and graphs, global variables and graphs. Um, no name collisions between states in graphs. So for instance, I can have multiple states called intro, but only one can be in this graph. Um, okay. Graphs contain those things. Okay, what can a state contain? States. Contain um, shows verbs shows verbs wires gates costs paths. Functions, paths, contain shows, verbs, wires, gates, costs, functions. So anything a path can contain, a state can contain. But states also can contain paths. That makes sense. Uh, these can contain variables as well. All right. Um, now, if you are a if you are a wire I'll do this. Nah, that's fine. If you are a wire or a cost. then you can contain any of the V star types. V const, V expert. If you are a gate, gates and expressions, we don't need to, uh, yeah, so gates, expressions, and constants Those are all empty. You should have no children at all. Now paths can contain marks and nothing else can contain a mark and a mark is always empty. Function is always empty. Variable is always empty. 
a show and a verb are always empty. Okay. Okay. And then uh, other things which have to work here are paths. In addition, they must enter a state. Must, uh, yeah, they're always contained inside of a state, so that's the state they leave. And then the path goes to that, but that has to be a name match for a state that actually exists inside the current graph. In this graph, in containing graph, yeah. So if you've got a path, you go up to its graph, and then you got to go find its outgoing state. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, so the checks on mar oh subgraph, right. So a state can contain a subgraph, and the subgraphs are empty. And the subgraphs have an additional check, which is that if I have a state with a subgraph, So a state with a subgraph doesn't contain anything but the subgraph. It's um, marks are attached to paths that leave a subgraph and match terminals. to a path that leaves a subgraph and matches a terminal of the subgraph, right? So if I've got a mark, then I'm attached to a path and the state that, that path leaves is a subgraph and that subgraph has a terminal that matches the mark. Or I am attached to a path that enters a subgraph Right, so I need two different kinds of mark. I missed this before when I was setting up the system. So this will be an out mark. There also needs to be an in mark. And so all the marks I've written are cases of out mark. But I also need a in mark. And they need to be distinct because I might need to mark, mark a single path with in marks and out marks. Okay, so with that. This is a rule for an out mark. Now an in mark attaches to a graph that enters a subgraph and matches an initial of the subgraph. And on the other hand, If we have a subgraph, we want to check all out, uh, only one unmarked outgoing path, or at most one unmarked outgoing path, no duplicate marks. All right. All right. 
So wires and costs need to reference a in scope variable. Where in scope means um, something that is in the same state, graph, or that is global. Okay, so those are the checks that I could run on this thing uh, in order to give feedback on what's working and what's broken. And um, if we built that, Oh boy. Um, do, 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 do. do I want to build the checks or do I want to build the interpreter? That's the next question. The nice thing about building the checks first is that they are a little simpler to implement and that way I can get my hands dirty working with the story cell structure without having to uh, do something hard with it right away. Right, I can kind of get used to the way it would feel to work with the structure and get some basic patterns down. It'll also be nice to have that check up and running. The downside is that it's kind of dry and boring and it's going to take a while. It's going to take a lot of time to do all that. And when it's done, I still won't be any closer to knowing if the cell structure is even a helpful, like if this particular model is even going to be a helpful way to do things, right? The working on the interpreter gets me closer to answering the question that I am basically asking with this, which is, is this a good uh, model for the story system? And and so I'm a little torn on what I want to do. The interpreter is also going to be difficult and slow. And I don't think that it's going to help me debug much. Like if I do the checks, I don't think it's going to help much with debugging on the interpreter side. Either way, the interpreter is going to be just as hard. So maybe the interpreter is the right thing to start with. If I start finding any cases where the, somehow a check would help with debugging, I can switch to that. But I think we work on the interpreter and check if the magic works. Right. And if it doesn't for some reason, or if the debugging is painful, like if the debugging is painful, we just work on d diagnostics inside the interpreter to help with that. If any of those overlap with checking, then great. But we don't want to, I don't think I want to get bogged down in all the minutia of running these checks to, to sort of bolt down this structure the way I imagine it. If there are possibilities that small tweaks to the structure's rules will become necessary. But the way I would learn that is by doing the interpreter, not by doing the checks. So I think the checks kind of lock me in harder. So while I'm going to, while I'm experimenting, I kind of want to move towards the thing that tests the magic, right? I want to answer the question and have room for iteration left open, which means flying blind a little bit more. I think that's the right thing to do. So we'll put off these ideas. Uh, still probably useful to do, especially if I do stick with this structure, but I think building the interpreter is the right next thing. So let's do this and think about what it's going to take to build the interpreter. So the interpreter would work like this. First of all, it would need to know which game, which graph and initial state is the beginning of the game. So game intro is the uh, one I want to start with.
So we got to be able to initialize it with a graph and an initial state inside that graph. We also need to be able to um, set up, we, we need some kind of data structure for storing all the variables. We have these variables here plus some local variables uh, on some of the graphs uh, like right here and on some of the states inside some of the graphs like right here and right here. So I need to be able to do that. Um, well, let's see, how early do I reach that? Thief. Yeah, so I start touching a variable right there. So why don't we say that we need to be able to um, prepare data structure for variables, variable states, right? That's a part of initializing it. And then we need the ability to walk the graph. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna go here, show the intro, and then we're gonna walk the graph and find the verbs and show those uh, as options, right? And you go until you find a verb and stop at that point before you move on. So here you would look ahead and find one, two, three verbs by going down your three paths and each one cuts off the walk there. And then and then we would need to be able to implement setting those. So yeah, we need to be able to do uh, the graph look ahead stuff. And once we do one verb here, we're gonna have to implement a wire. So this would be um, uh, this would be like handling wires at least, right? To change the state and then that goes automatically. So there's no verb here, it just has to go to act one. Goes into the act one graph. Initial state town arrive is the only option. So that's should be automatic as it's looking ahead. So then it should find the subgraph here and then it knows it needs to show this. So it can show that and then it needs to go here. And so it goes into the evening subgraph, right? So we need to be able to, let's let's put that in there. We need to be able to handle the graph stack. And in order to do things like this, we're gonna be able to need to, we're gonna need to be able to do things like graph from name. This one here is going to require variable from name, state from graph, and name. Okay. Okay. I think this is enough planning. I got a good idea of where we're getting started here. So let's try to, um, let's try to build, I'm feeling a little unsure about which side of the screen to use for this. I'm gonna start over here. Um, so this is for construction. Let's try to build the new story machine that was gonna run on story cells. Story cell interpreter types. Story cell interpreter looks like this. It goes, let's see. Um, things it's gonna need. Well, it's gonna need a data structure for variable states. So let's go with variable 
We'll just make simple chains of these to get started. They'll have a name and we'll give each variable a 64-bit integer value, okay? And so then there'll be global vars like this and we'll initialize those by just chaining them on. And then for each, um, we need to know, we just need to have the root cell here. And then we'll implement things like those name lookup for graphs by just scanning those. Uh, name lookup for global variables goes on that. So this will need to get pre-processed to set up all the values. The, uh, okay. That's some fixed information there. So there's the global variables. We're gonna need to be able to If we're going to do look ahead, I think we're going to be able to need to, we're going to need the ability to um, execute things like wires and then roll them back. So here we would just see like, oh, there's a verb here. We don't need to look ahead further. There's a verb and there's no gate or um, cost, which would possibly disqualify the verb. Uh, so we immediately can use the verb to get that far. And then when we're looking ahead again, we're like looking ahead, looking ahead, looking ahead. There's not a split until here. This is the first time there's a non-deterministic node. So then it starts looking ahead. This would just be executed up to this point. And then tavern, we look into the, yeah. So this would modify the stack to look ahead. And then we need to be able to unmodify the stack. So I'm definitely gonna need the ability to uh, um, save and restore states. as a part of the interpreter's function. Now, what's a stack gonna look like? So a, a node on the stack tells us how to pop later. So it's got to tell us about a graph that we were at and what node in that graph we were on. Pop graph, pop state. Right, and then we have a stack of those. Now, Stack. 
update from graph and name. Yeah, that's just a scan for now. The graph stack looks like that, okay. What else do we have? Um, graph stack, save and restore. So yeah, we gotta we gotta have a plan for how we can save and restore. I don't know what exactly is gonna go here, but it's gonna have to be something like a stack, some global variable values. If I make this a Q, it can be a little easier. Yeah. So for the snapshot, I'll use Qs instead of stacks so that they don't have to run out of like flip flop. They don't have to go change order and change it back. Um. Um. Um, wait, if I have a stack and I look at its elements one at a time, push them onto another stack, it's in the opposite order of the stack I popped from, right? You got one, two, three, four, five on a stack. You pop the five, you push it, you pop the four, you push it. Yeah, yeah, so the new stack is backwards. If you then, okay, why don't we do that? Why don't we just have it go back and forth? That seems fine. Like that. Um, Okay, so that's how we'll do uh, save and restore the interpreter states for that much. We don't have a plan here for um, we don't have a plan here for scopes of variables. Now scopes could be we could make a separate graph data structure. So instead of operating right on the cells, I would have a graph data structure. And the reason I might do this is so that I can have graph local variables. More easily. And then that can have state local variables more easily too. Um, But the hard thing about that is it starts to make things much more uh, heavyweight. So I think the way I would prefer is I will use periods to rename these. And so instead of calling these global variables, I'm just gonna call them variables. And so if I wanna speed this up and organize it better later, what I'll do is I will have variables that live in scopes. But for now, I'm gonna just turn everything into a global variable. And something like this, um, well, there's no variables there. Um, something like this would be called tavern.ticket or tavern.enter.visit, right? That way I can avoid making this data structure more complicated because the more complicated this data structure gets, the more it locks me into this model, right? Like the heavier weight the interpreter gets, the more work I put in, the harder it is to tweak and modify this. So the lighter weight I make this, the more quickly I can iterate if there are any issues or tweaks I need want to make, right? So that's the plan. Um, for variable states, graph states, and that should let me save and restore all of the variables and the stack. 
So the other thing I'm going to need, this are st these are variables in stacks, but I need the ability to point at the current graph and the current state with the interpreter. So it's going like, I'm running this one, and then when it pushes onto the stack, it takes those, puts them onto the stack, and then updates the graph and the state uh, as necessary. Now this is going to be quite interesting. How is that going to work? That's the part that is a little tricky. So the interesting hard part there, you know, we also are going to want um, No, I don't think there's an issue there. Oh, another thing we're going to want is when we're doing this, the interesting part is when there's multiple paths, we could do it recursively and say, hey, any paths coming out, um, you call a function, which then looks into that and rec like looks ahead from there and looks ahead from there. So each, each additional path is a recursion. If there are any cycles, it will get caught in an infinite loop. Now, I have the idea that there would be checks that wouldn't run on the cell structure, but that would run on the graph structure that would ensure that isn't possible. But if I don't have those checks, then I have two choices. One, I can just risk it. I can say, let's do, um, let's do the recursive thing that can loop forever uh, and just avoid having any cycles manually to avoid the loop or i can say no 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 i don't want to i don't want to have i don't want to have the the prototype getting stuck in loops while i'm working on it and so i'm going to put in the extra work to detect cycles at runtime and like stop and show an error there i think i think for now i'll go with the the riskiest option of all and I'll wait to see if that is becoming a, a heavier problem and deal with it then. Um, so, so we'll just be able to implement that with a recursive function. And then handling a wire will be rather trivial. So let's keep looking ahead at what else I might uh, want to do now. Uh, looking at my maps. So I can set variables with the wires. I go into the evening graph here. I can go, okay, let's say I went to a tavern subgraph. And there's a verb there. Which we stop at. And then there's a verb. By the way, do the verbs. Yeah, they do the wrong thing. They should look like this, which is gonna mean that I have a bunch more of these that are not implemented. Yeah, okay, okay, that makes sense. So let's do that real quick. Um, verb thief.c. So here I'm just switching over to filling in the content that the, the system is link, trying to link to. Something like that, okay. Um, yeah, okay. And then verb beast slayer c beast slayer c.
Alright, so what else have we got? We need a verb for wake up. Wake up isn't one word. I don't know why I keep thinking it is when I spell things. Verb sleep. Verb tavern. Yeah, so I might want to rethink how I'm going to author the fancy strings for verbs since they're really small and there's a lot of them. Feels kind of annoying, but I don't want to get bogged down in, in reimagining the uh, fancy string content system right now. All right, us verb ale dot c. Verb ale, order the ale. Taking a little moment to play with my candle, spill the wax around, make the flame big. Nice. Okay. Back to it. Um, let's see here. Um, okay, so we got the verbs filled in. What was I, I was looking for what's gonna come next. So let's say I went to the tavern. So we have a plan for these variables. We have a plan for the wires. Uh, I have a good plan for these. So I need to be able to, oh, let me put some more info on the checks that I just remembered. Uh, so story cells, um, At most one verb per state. Okay. Um, so yeah, I need, I already have a plan to do the, the look ahead to, find, to, to go until you find a verb.
So one big thing that I'm going to need to actually make this thing work the way it should is I'm going to need um, to change kind of how the, the interface works a little bit. I don't want to get bogged down in that today, but a big thing here is that like uh, these show, I've been thinking of them as you stop at when it, at you completely stop, like you run until you find something to show and then you stop and then you have to have a set of verbs from there. And I think I want to switch to a, a mental model of this where as you are going, you are sort of discovering linearly more text to show and you don't stop with that until, so you can kind of like imagine just hitting like next, 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 next. And that's a default behavior. There doesn't need to be a set of verbs there. The only time that that doesn't work is when there's a branch to multiple viable verbs. And that's where the verb list gets shown to the player. That's the new model I want to go for. And I would need to change the interface a little bit so that it can kind of like, like, if I show you right now, right, if I start playing, like I press enter and it like reveals text to me, right? I can go back. I want this to be a little richer. I want this to just keep going. Like here it reaches a, a verb. But what I would really like is that after I get this far and I visit a tavern, this doesn't get erased. But instead, the story just keeps scrolling and scrolling and scrolling infinitely. And then it stops with a verb. I pick one and then it erases the verb op selections I had and puts more story in place where I made that cho choice. So it'd be magic if I click this and then this came out one paragraph at a time underneath what I had before until it reaches this and then I can go like this and then this comes out and I can it looks like this um, uh, these aren't laid out correctly either so this will no longer be hand coded it'll be um, automatic from the list of verbs and then these would scroll out step by step and and so on and so on and so on so I don't have that um, which means some of this is going to be a little funny. Like I have to think about what do I do? What I'll do is if I'm on a show and I look ahead and find another show in a linear path before there are any splits, then I will stop there and say that I just need a single verb that, uh, is like continue and present that. And then I'll update the interface later to have that quality that I actually want, uh, which is that it looks past the shows until it finds a verb. Uh, and then you use that verb to send yourself going down the path towards the, the, the like that you, that you picked. Um, save and restore. Okay, we know how we're gonna do that. Graph look ahead, we know how we're gonna do that recursively, handling the wire. So if I go to the tavern, the interesting thing here is we have cost. So this is where we would wanna have, um, gate and cost. Uh, cost is just like a slightly, is just a high level combination of a gate and uh, a wire that does some uh, common operation of subtracting something from a cost, but only letting you go, or subtracting something from a resource, but only if you have the amount of that resource that you need to not go below zero when you do that, right? Um, so gate and cost modify the verb and look ahead system. Right now there are dead ends. Um, so I will just live with that because the model doesn't avoid it. I have a plan for how to evolve the model to avoid it, but I didn't want to overcomplicate the first steps. Um, this isn't implemented yet, so that's fine. I think this is enough. I think we can get started on this. So I need some uh, where's my struct? Okay, I'm gonna want that. Let's take cell interpreter functions. Oh, 
Okay, interpreter functions will include interpreter. The interpreter is going to need an arena for manipulating its stack and a stack of the, the, the free chain of the stacks. It's got a current graph and a current state. Okay, here we go. So we're going to want things like interpreter will be interp and then um, we'll say new and I'll give it a cell and uh, or, or we'll just actually we'll actually just use strings for this so we'll go graph initial that's how we'll tell it how to start um, although it's going to need to know the root cell as well. So we give it the root cell, the name of the graph, and the name of the initial state. And that should be enough to get it started. Um, that will be where we implement the preparation of variable states. Um, then we're going to want some machinery here. We're going to want a way to free one of these at the end of a run. Stack top, stack free. So We'll, when we're pushing, we will push something on and then copy the graph and the state into the stack. When we're done, we will read off the top. When we're popping, we'll read off the top, front the graph and the state, put them in, do the pop, and then figure out how to update the state from there. Okay, so there's my push and pop for the stack. That's not the whole idea for the stack, but it's the main data structure manipulator. The rest is uh, just some trivial copies in and out. Um, then we need the save and the restore. Interp snapshot save. So I'll give it an arena and the interpreter, and that will save a snapshot onto this arena and then we'll have see interp snap restore I'll give it the interpreter and the snapshot and it will restore the state that was saved into that snapshot um, graph look ahead so this will be a part of how it runs which I'm not quite sure how I want to think about this. So, um, yeah, so we'll, we know we need these. So let's pull those out as helpers we want to build first. Graph look ahead is a little complicated. It's a piece of the graph, but the execution or the in interpretation loop or something like that. So the interpretation loop has the job of saying, here's my current state, go until it finds something it wants to show, and then look and see if it wants to show ver verbs. And it uses look ahead to figure that out. Okay. Um, variable from name. Okay. 
So while it's handling um, while it's handling a state, it might need to do a wire and then another wire and then another wire. Um, and wires are modifying the state of the thing and those can then, the order of between wires, the order between wires shows gates and costs all matter because you know costs that you can't pay you can't go down that path yeah so you need to be able to do things like keep track of how much you've executed. So the verb is kind of floating up there as an exception to the rule right now, which might be wrong. But the rest of it, it's like you want to run a wire, then run the show func like instruction or cell and And then well, while that one's being displayed, you're not moving forward, but then you need to remember that you've displayed that already when you come back and keep running, um, which might be with a verb or without a verb. We'll see, we'll see how it works out. I think what I'm getting at though is I might need, I might need something like a uh, cell or something like that pointer that looks like this it's kind of what I'm anticipating because when I'm inside one of these states I want to know like okay we're doing this wire okay we're doing this show and okay we're back from the show let's you know follow this path and then we end up you know after you follow this path you end up on another state or you're doing its show or something yeah Okay, so when we save a snapshot, we do need those things to get saved. That finds a variable. We have to figure out how to do that, that, and that. Okay. Yep. I think that I think that the only part I don't super know is what does the interface need to look like for using one of these. So if I run the new, what'll happen is I I create the new interpreter, and then I want to run it to the point where it has some final thing that it wants to show and some list of verbs then I will stop and let that get displayed so what I kind of want is like when I run to, what's to have it say like here's the What am I trying to say? I want it to be able to say like, here's the, um, here's the output from running and the output from running is the fancy string and the verbs as another fancy string. But I can't literally have it outputting fancy string content it has to be outputting the fancy string procedures because those need to run every frame while they're active because of the way that's structured right now that i could update later but that's the way it needs to be for now okay so i think an api for that would look something like this So 
to run ahead with, um, sometimes I need to be able to tell it, well, let's just have it run ahead without a parameter and with the ability to return some kind of result. And the result for now will look like this. There'll be a data pointer and a list of verb pointers like this. And those can just relate from the cells, right? So the cells contain these, these pointers here. So this is the thing that got shown you look ahead for verbs, you make the list of your verbs, those go there, you return that there on that arena. And then when you want to tell it how to continue running, what you have to do is say like, there's some kind of process by which you go, okay, run this with a verb selection now. So, um, when we create these verbs, we'll do two things. We'll give it the data of the verb, which corresponds to this part. But we'll also want to give it the, um, like a cell pointer list that's like the path like this and that's the path that's built up um, when we discover the verb we are starting from a point we're iterating down through the DAG and so we're looking at paths and states and paths and states and we're building a chain there and so we'll associate that to the verb data so that if they select it it then goes oh you go like this and it can execute them without having to check and go oh, is there a branch here? Do I need to handle the branch? It's like, well, the branch has already been uh, resolved by the verb look ahead and by the user selection of the verb. So the, this doesn't get shown to the player. This is the instruction that comes back into the machine. And so then these can be structured like that. And when we come back here we can go something like this Do I want to do it like this? If I do it like this, then what happens is you select it. Well, what's going to happen is you click and that gets locked in, but then it might have several spots along the way where it has to show something. Right, so it's not like it can do it all in one go and be done. Instead, I think this has to get written into the interpreter somehow, and the interpreter then is like walking along this selected path and doesn't stop doing that until it's done. Now, no look ahead needs to happen at this point because it's locked in. But once we run select path, it'll run. And when we get a verb count of zero, we'll be able to just automatically say, oh, then continue means don't select a path and just tell it to keep running. So when no verbs come back, the interface just gives you the continue option and then you press continue and no path gets selected, it keeps running. 
if a verb if a verb doesn't come back it means the interpreter will keep running when you resume it but if a verb comes back then you have to select if at least one verb comes back then you have to select one of the paths given by the verbs before you run okay and then and so then we have fixed path walking which is going to be like um This is a little funny, it's a little funky. So I think what I need to change, I need some kind of way to link through these. So like, I need something like this. And then we'll go those chain together like this and they point to cells and then we have to have uh, uh, a free cell ref chain right so when we are done with these they all they all get freed This can be like this. Um, so if path putter is zero, we just run as it, we, we, we run, you know, we do stuff like, when path putter is zero, we run, we're allowed to use look ahead to generate a result with uh, verbs in it and stuff like that. If there is a path putter, then we run ahead by by going, oh, uh, run, run the, um, run the cell right here and then take it off this chain put it in the free list advance this pointer through its chain while we're going so we're like run this and then run this one right and they're getting moved down and advancing forward through the chain and if if that is empty or if that hits like something where we need to show something then we stop and show that And when we resume, when we stop and show it, we show it without any verbs. So when we resume, we resume without selecting anything new, and this continues. Once this is empty, we then start looking ahead, and if we, um, if we find anything we need to show before the decision is made, before a decision needs to be made, we just show those again with no verbs. But once it, as soon as we get to a point where there's an ambiguity, we return the verbs, and then the the verbs have to be used. That's that's the plan. Okay, okay. This is making sense from all the different angles. Um, basically, once there's ambiguity, it's because this is this this resolves ambiguity if it's not null. But if it's null and the graph is ambiguous, that's where verbs show up here, and then this gets selected to resolve the ambiguity again. I think this could work. There, there's some difficulties here, but I think this could work. Um, okay. So that's that's the function outline. That's the outline in terms of functions. Let's implement all of the easy ones real quick. So this is going to go. Um, oh, you know what? I skipped over these graph from name, state from graph and name, variable from name. Um, uh, let's see, snap. Yeah, let's do sc cell sc graph from name. I give it the. I guess this just runs on the root cell for now. Here's the name, graph cell, state from graph, 
and name. So I give it a graph cell and a name, and it returns a state cell. Um, variable from name. So this one's interesting. This one I need to go var from name. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick. We're just going to do this. So it's going to use the interpreter, and that's got the list of variables. And it's also going to use its graph and its cell pointers to do the scope. So it'll take the graph and cell pointer and the name, turn that into a name, and look for that. If it doesn't find it, it will take the graph and the name, look for that. And if it doesn't find that, it'll take just the name and look for that. It's going to manually, it's going to internally just do all of that, even though it's a lot more extra work. It gets us up and running to test the semantics sooner. This wouldn't allow me to do anything like reaching into the state for a different graph or a different cell or a different state, right? Um, that wouldn't be possible because this this interface only lets you access through the current cell pointers inside the interpreter it doesn't let you specify which scopes you're it doesn't have parameters for the scopes that you're interested in so uh with that limitation i'll have to um i'll have to keep that in mind and and if i get to the point where i do want to break out of that change this part but i don't think this part is super um, difficult to tweak. I'm playing with my candle again. Give me a sec. Alrighty, so put those functions into the system. Okay. So we go S, let's start with the arena. We create a new arena. We push the interpreter on it. We set the arena inside the interpreter, the one we created. We set the root cell for the interpreter from the one that got passed in. So those have been set. Now the other thing we have to do here is, uh, let's start with this being null up here. We're going to go graph equals sc graph from name. So I give it the root cell and the name of the graph I want. And then I go, uh, if that gave me a cell, then give me the state. Here's the graph. Here's the initial state I want. If state does not equal zero and state kind equals sc cell kind initial, then the rest of this can go. And that gives us a way to set graph and state. And then the cell we're interested in is the first child of the state.
those should all be nil because this starts off nil. These are nil. The variables. So we need to prepare the variables then. And um, that's just going to be a recursive walk where we give it the interpreter and the root cell to begin with. And then Yeah, that should work. Um, okay. Let's throw this one in there real quick. So the way this works is um, we do a loop over, well, let's start by saying if we have, now let's just start by looping over the children. That part we definitely want. Uh, SC cell, cell first child. So this is gonna be inside of a switch on the cell kind. If we have a root, then we do the loop just to in iterate down. Interpreter child, okay? If If we have a global block, then as we do the loop, we want to see all of the variables that we can find. Now, there's just an easier way to do this. I'm going to just say we always do this, right? And then if the cell we're looking at is a variable, Then we're going to reverse up through the parent chain because we built that in earlier. We're going to reverse up the parent chain to figure out the full name for the variable. If we look at the cell's parent and we find that the parent is a <clears throat> global block, then then we emit a variable by the name cell string if we look at the parent and the name uh, and the kind of parent we have is a state or is a graph, then we emit a variable by the name given by the parent name dot the cell name. And then if we find a state or an, which is, can be initial state terminal, or if we find a path, path is disallowed for now. Probably I want variables that can live in paths, but I would need to use a non-name based scoping system to get there. And I don't want to do that right now. So path are disallowed. Any other kind is just disallowed. So we could just say like, something like this, um, invalid variable was found under 
so which is invalid. How about that? Go away. So this is straight expand cell string straight expand parent cell or kind string parent kind um Okay, now if we find something in one of these states, what we have to do is go to cell graph equals parent parent, and we want to assert that the graph kind is actually a graph then. And then we want to go emit variable and put another layer in like that. Okay. So that's how we'll do variables. All right, we will get these implemented shortly. And I think that's it for this one, right? So we, if we have a variable, we figure out the name of the variable by looking up through its parents, and then we iterate everything. So we just find all the variables without having to think about it. Okay, so let's take a quick detour to implement this. Uh, we want uh, the big functions, the push f, on the interpreter's arena. This gives us the string. And then we want the variable to go on the interpreter's arena. So the name goes there. The value is initially zero. And we go S SLL stack push interpreter vars var. So we make the variable. We've got the name that we grabbed off of that stuck there, initialize to zero, stick it onto the chain. And as far as errors go, we're just gonna um, uh, let's just print that directly for now. We can do something else later. Or I could do error emit, I suppose. Yeah, so that would be like this.
right, looking good, looking good. Let's figure out which piece to do next. Talking about this. What are you talking about? Redefinition of formal parameters, but how? This says it takes a string eight, graph from name. This returns a string eight, right? Let me just spread this out so it's a little less confusing. Oh, I see the problem. I see the problem. We got graph here. Let's call this graph cell. There we go, okay. So, so I think that's good, except this function should return the interpreter it created if it succeeded at creating one. Um, Uh, to release the interpreter, all we have to do is arena release on the arena. That's all the memory that's attached to that interpreter. I don't want to do the run or path select stuff yet. Um, this one's not too difficult actually, given the way we set up the data structure, but it's still part of a more complicated part. Let's deal with the simpler data structure stuff first. So stack push. Um, for this, we need to allocate a new stack node. First, we try to get it from the free list. And if that works, then we pop it off the free list. Otherwise, we push it onto the arena. And either way, we've got the stack pointer now. We want to push it onto the interpreter's stack at the top and then return it. Whoever created this push onto the stack will fill its content from there. Pop is just gonna go, okay, grab the stack top. And if that's null, there's nothing we can do. We can't pop it. But if it's not null, then we do a stack pop on this guy but we want to push that node onto the free list so it can get reused.
Now, snapshot saving is a little bit interesting. So to save a snapshot, first we will push it onto the arenas to allocate it. And then we'll fill out its parts from the interpreter. So as we loop over the variables, we create copies onto the arena. We don't need to reallocate the names because if we invalidate the interpreter, we'll assume we invalidate the snapshot too. So these snapshots are no good for serialization unless we come back here and do a copy of the name. But I'm just gonna do a shallow copy on the name and then save the value. And that gets pushed onto the stack that is contained inside the snapshot of variables called var, var backward, vars backward. The reason it's backward is because we are iterating a stack and pushing it onto a stack. So it gets the reverse order. Same thing here. We look at the stack parts starting from the stack top and iterating down. Stack, new stack. Now to copy over stack data, we just go new stack uh, pop graph equals stack pop graph. Um, pop state, pop state, pop cell, pop cell. Stack backward gets the new stack. Okay, so the stack and the variables are all copied. And then I will copy over the graph. The state and the cell. And that creates my snapshot. Then I should be able to restore that snapshot by doing all the same things the other way around. So the first thing I have to do here is clear out, well, I don't need to clear out variables. What I have to do with variables is a little different. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the snaps backwards variables. I feel like I should just do the variables forward. And so the way I'm gonna achieve that is I'm gonna go vars right there. As we iterate these, we're gonna have sc var v first and v last, like this. And I'm gonna push them onto it like a queue. So the first one I visit goes on first and they get pushed on in order. And then at the end, the snapshot gets the vars from V first. That way, if I start from vars, I iterate them in the same order that they're stored there. The advantage to that is now I should be able to make a V source and a V dest like this. And then they should iterate like this. And the, the thing I'll do is along the way, we'll make sure these are all in sync the way we think they should be. Uh, like that. And then we'll go v dest 
the value equals v source value. So we restore the value of every variable. Now, the next thing we need to do is empty out the stack. So as long as the interpreter stack is not null, we just do sll, um, we just do interpreter stack pop. All right, so that just empties out the stack. Then I look at the snapshots backwards stack. And with each of those, I go s c stack. Um, this will be called the snap stack. Then I make a stack like this, uh, a stack cell like this, and I go stack push. I push it onto the interpreter one at a time using that uh, data structure interface, and I go stack. Um, yeah, here we want to grab this, and we just copy from the snap stack onto the the real stack one at a time. And since this is backwards, the top of this stack is the bottom of the real stack, and so we emptied the stack and then filled it up this way so it should be in order and then finally we fill the interpreter up with the snapshots graph state and cell values and so that should be a snapshot restore function that works for us all right, what do we got? Graph from name. Okay, these are simple data structure stuff too. So this is just a walk over the root cell to look for a graph name. We only we don't need to recurse here um, because we're assuming we got a root cell and we're assuming the children will be, all the graphs in the entire system will be children of the root. Um, so if the child's kind is a uh, graph and the name we're looking for matches the string on the cell then this is the cell we're looking for and there we go now if we're looking for a state uh, it's very similar uh, except we rename that to graph cell. And this can be one of several things. This can be initial. This can be oh, man, state. This can be terminal. Those all count as states. And then we check if it matches and that's the only place where states can come from. So that's how we can find a state from a name there. Now for the last one, it's a little bit more um, of an interpreter machinery than a uh, simple data structure. I don't wanna just walk and look for that exact name because this name is the local name but the total name has the like extension with the periods in it, right? So what we wanna do is start by going, okay, uh, we're gonna need a scratch arena for this so we can build temporary strings. And, and then I'm gonna need, um, Let's see, I'm gonna need try state local, okay? So we go if the interpreter has a state pointer and sc cell has var interpreter state has that bar then we're gonna build the full name by going 
straight push F, scratch arena, and we need three stages here. We need the name of the graph, the name of the state, and then the name of the variable. So the state looks like this, the graph looks like this, and then we go um, let's pull full name out like this, alright? And so we need that helper to um, cell has var takes in a cell and a name, and this is a lot more like the ones above it, except we're not trying to get the cell. I guess we could get it. We could go cell like this. Um, var cell from cell. And so then this can just be like exactly like these. Um, we only have one possible way to match, and that's if it's called a variable. The name looks like that. Var cell from cell. Okay, so this goes se var cell from cell does not equal zero. So that goes there, that goes there. There's our full name. Try local state, try graph, try state local, try graph local. graph does not equal zero and the graph contains the variable, then that goes there, that captures like that, and that looks like that. If full name dot size is equal to zero, is a requirement because we don't want to, if we pick a name in an early stage, we want that to be the one we go with. Um, and here, try global. Here we just make the full name be the name that we're looking for. And so one way or another, we end up with a full name because if none of, the, none of these find a variable, we'll just default to looking for a global. I guess we could do, no, we can't, We because globals can come from cells that we can't just get a pointer too easily. So we'll just have a fallback like that. And then we'll go uh, look for the variable. Scan for the variable. All right, so that goes like this. We have these variables that live in the interpreter. And we wanna go if the variable's name matches the full name that we're looking for, then grab that variable as our result to return. Perfect, okay. All right, so everything here is implemented now except these two. Okay. This one we can do because it's like this. Um, select path. Much like with the stack, I'm just going to make a thing that goes um, cell ref se interp ref alloc. Uh, so those can live down here and help us with this. Uh, the reason for that is so that I can use the free list without having to manually touch it every time. So we want um, cell ref free. If that's not zero, we pop off the free list. Otherwise, we push onto the arena.
and then we return the reference that is allocated that way. Uh, and here, we just push this cell ref onto the cell ref free list. Okay, that's the uh, free version. Okay. Cool, 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 cool. All right, so selecting a path, that should be like this. First of all, this should only ever happen when the interpreter path putter is zero. Then looping over the path that's been passed down, we go give me a cell ref. Uh, we want a first and last right now. We then allocate a, a reference and we set the cell in the reference equal to the cell in the path array here. And we push that onto the local queue we're building. So that builds up, turns this array into a queue, chained together like this, and then goes, um, okay, the new path putter is whatever the first in that queue is when we were done. So that creates the chain of path pointers that we're gonna take. I'm gonna rename this to node because I want this to be able to point at paths and states alike. And this has to be if the node kind is a CS cell kind state. Or an initial or a terminal. Then, yeah, that gets added together. Okay. Okay, so there we go. So that's how we set up the path. Now all we have to do is figure out how this whole machine runs. Let's take a look at our to-do list. Initialize, data structure vari for variables are prepared. We have a graph stack. We haven't really implemented the use of the graph stack yet, so I'll save that for now. Save and restore, we have that. Graph from name, state from graph, variable from name. We don't have an interpretation loop or a graph look ahead. We don't have, yeah, so this stuff here is the good stuff we don't have yet, right? Okay, cool.
All right, let's figure out how this works. So, we start off with our node pointer looking at a cell. And what we basically want to do is we want to look ahead. Uh, we want we want to keep we want to look and see if it has something to show. Let's start with the very basic thing it has to do. Something to show. So it's going to say, does this have something to show? Then it's going to start scanning ahead. If it finds any branches that lead to multiple verbs that are reachable, or if it leads to, if it finds a reachable verb ahead, then it has to, um, then it has to build the set of verbs that are um, going to be exported to the user. If, as it looks ahead, it finds another show, then we don't provide a verb. It means it started looking ahead and it was deterministically set up to handle head into another thing to show with no verbs interceding. So it might as well not ask the user what they want to do because the next thing that has to happen is to go forward to that next thing that needs to show up anyways. Um, so there's nothing to ask. Now, if it's looking ahead and there are branches and some of those branches have things to show and some of them show different things, don't show those things, right? It's going along, it hasn't seen a show or a verb, but it finds a branch, then it needs to keep looking and it doesn't know for sure if it's going to have a verb or not. Um, for now, we'll say it definitely has a verb because it can't, we don't have gates or costs in there yet which would allow us to eliminate verbs so it's definitely if it's branching then it won't know which way to take unless there's a way for the player to select and there's no way for the machine to select by eliminating some branches so if it sees a branch it's going to have to say we need to stop here and look ahead to verbs that that the player can use to check to decide which path to take from here and those become the verbs we present Um, I'm trying to think here. So, so if it's got these branches, then we have to look ahead. If we find a show instruction while we're looking ahead, we don't show it, but we don't stop because we still need to figure out what verb or verbs lie beyond that so that we can collect the verbs and show them. So we're, we're looking ahead to find verbs. If a show shows up, that's not interrupting this look ahead anymore. If, if we find no branch, and if we're going along linearly and we find a show, then we don't need to show a verb. If we're going along linearly and we find a verb, then we can stop and just present that one verb as the option. If we're going along linearly and then we find a branch, then we have to go until we find verbs on all paths. And we skip over the shows from there. We can branch as many times as we need to from there to find the verbs. Does that make sense? Here's the logic. Um, let's draw a picture of it. If linear path finds show no verbs then no verbs if linear path finds verb then one verb if branch then look ahead on all paths on all branches for verbs ignore shows right that's the logic of the look ahead okay and then um let's do first with no look ahead no verbs we just go we find a show and we show that and then the system gets stuck. Can't do anything else. 
and then we'll figure out how to make it advance from there. So we can that way we can just sort of start sketching out structures here. Um, it's going to look at the cell it's on and see if it's null or not. So here we go. You got a loop. If the interpreter's cell is non is is zero, then we'll break out of the loop. Otherwise, okay. So this really means as long as we have a cell to look at, then we're going to switch on the cell kind. If the cell we're looking at, so the cell the cell we're looking at here should be below the level of um, yeah. So if we find a show then we're going to we're going to set here we have this result we're going to set the results data to the cells putter and that's it, that's all we're gonna do. So that happens, we need to stop the loop. Um, stop the loop and return the result. Okay, so there we go. There's our sketch of the first idea in the system which is go forward through the cells until we find a show and return that. Now what we're going to have to do is switch over to the main game structures here. We're completely tearing out the old ideas um, about how some of this is structured. So they kind of, this is to kind of take a minute. We have um, story fragments are all good. Font slots are all good, but this right here is out. Instead of a story machine, we're now working on the story cell interpreter. We'll just call that the interpreter. Um, oh, right, 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 right. Okay, so this is busted, but we don't have any choice right now because nothing is going to build if I don't get keep those. I'm going to need to replace all of the uses of variables like this with something that looks more like, um, right, this would become like uh, if sc interp I, I, I don't know exactly what it's like, variable, something like this. Here's the interpreter we're interested in. Here's the name we're interested in, tavern. Dot, um, maps, tavern, enter, visit equals one else right this would become like this um, or we could just say hey we expect that you're using this um, inside of this scope right so you don't need to reach into tavern you don't need to reach into enter That'll just be available there. Although I still think we probably do want the ability to reach into these because like the tavern ticket thing is probably something we want to reach into from here. Not sure yet. Not sure yet. So I 
the other thing is like do i want the con conditionals living here inside the um essentially the content side or is what i want to do to be something more like case um oh, what would this be like this would be um Right, you could imagine like this turning into it's a little bit nasty I'm not sure this is the best picture for it but you could imagine some kind of evolution along these lines right um, uh, another possibility here is that we just want something like this might be more useful I'm not sure not sure not sure not sure there's sort of a point where you start wanting to blend between the ability to write code and the ability to emit content and it makes you makes me wonder if it sort of makes me wonder if like at this point I want immediate mode to work right because if this could just be C code then it could look like this right but the reason I don't want it to have to be immediate mode is that things like these that modify the variables also want to be able to do things like blocking um, maybe this maybe this is fine this thing over here that's happening might actually be the way to do it. Uh, like when we when we attach content, we're attaching a procedure that generates content from the state of the game. Is the model there? Um, let's, let's keep this, which was the original thing that lived here. So what would happen is like we'd say, hey, whenever you're building one of these things, the show here, which stands for the the thing you want to emit to display to the user next, the next thing the player should interact with um, at least as as outgoing information to the player and uh, it might be that you want to have have the procedural selection of details on the other side so it's not inside the graph at a certain point that might be fine right I mean, this could get arbitrarily complex. If this wasn't a story game, you could imagine that what's happening here is it's taking the state of the game variables and using that to generate an entire level that you're going to play through or something. Or animations and stuff. Stuff you, you would want to stop having to control it from this. So yeah, I think maybe leaning into this is the right path. But this is not the time to do that. Let's go and put that in the... To do for this um, and 
and then we want reach into interpreter state from procedural content. Okay. So you're out and instead we have um, the interpreter So we're not setting up story machines at all. We're not building these at all. All of this is getting pulled out. Um, yep, you're being demoted for now. What do we do with the machine here? Gotcha. Okay, so all of this, all of this is out. You are kind of a part of this section here. This is stuff we could do if if we are inside of the story machine style thing. Now that we're doing the story interpreter instead, Okay. When we start a run, do we set up the story machine somewhere in here? Okay, here's where we're setting up the story machine. From here, what I want to do is say something like, Just have it init the interpreter by taking the story root from there. And so instead of having the story root live inside game state, we go down to the app interpreter function. Interpreter controls. Um, Init interpreter is going to have the job of accessors, frame accessors, interpreter controls. All right, we take if the app state interpreter equals does not equal zero.
then I want to free release the interpreter. And then I want to create a new one. And when you create a new interpreter, it wants to know what's the story root, what's the initial graph, what's the initial state. I believe those are the correct identifiers. Intro. Story machine update rule or render uh, tick rules, right? Very good. Okay. So instead, we'll have the story interpreter tick rules, the SC interpreter will come from the come from the app function for it and we want to build the fancy string for the main string here Okay, so what's gonna have to happen here is when we when we get this far, we wanna go, hey, um, let me assume that, that we have like, um, all right, we have a run arena, but that's like for the whole run, so I need like an interp, like a result arena, we'll call it that. And this is gonna be the interpreter result. So we don't actually need the interpreter here. What we need is the interpreter result. Interpreter, here's the result. Interpreter result. Init interpreter. Right, and then what's gonna happen is we have a way to run the interpreter and when you run the interpreter it's going to pop the result arena to zero and then it's going to set the interpreter result by going sc interp run it's going to use this arena it's going to use the interpreter and that's how it gets a new interpreter result puts it on that arena for the time being. And then when we init, so interpreter init, interpreter run, init interpreter, interpreter init, interpreter run, goes like that. Um, now where does the run arena get allocated. We'll allocate a result arena next to it. Okay, now 
to build the mainstream, we still have to do that part. Um, Right, and then we do uh, to grab the interpreter result, and the interpreter result. If the interpreter result data does not equal zero, then the story proc is that thing, and we run that. Right, and if it is zero, then we don't quite have a plan yet for how to do a dev mode in the new model, but it would be something like we grab the dev font and we go fancy um, string f, we go fancy system. Yeah, we do this. This is what I was looking for. Uh, we go null, like that. Just let you know that it's null. Uh, maybe we center that. Right. Uh, cool. So. It's already a pointer. Fancy system. Okay, so these all will just get marked as doing nothing at all. So the game state was living as memory in the story machine. We're gonna need to switch that around to just being something like this. Although technically our game state uh, is hardly even real, but I do need to be able to dereference it to avoid crashing. So we'll just hack that in there again like that. No story machine exists. So those are initially null. When we initialize the interpreter and run it, these get filled for the first time. This lives on the result arena. This has its own arena. And right, interpreter result doesn't have a definition. Interpreter result is just a getter. Looks right here. It goes like this. What draws you in? Um, that's a little weird. I'm not sure why it looks like this all of a sudden. Uh, it should be running the same one that it has always been running. And these are two of the strings from that. But um, I think maybe the problem is when I initialize the main string here, yeah, you can see I have a default style which lives right here and gets blocked out. Let's put that right here. There we go. Okay, so this screen looks like it always does. The difference is these are marked as alive, which now don't do anything. Um, and for now, my goal here is to homogenize everything. 
So right now I have this like special cases where like a screen like this puts the interactive alive stuff right here um, in line with other things. What I want to do is move to a system where that is a special case and where the general behavior is what I, I just put everything through the general behavior. And the general behavior is there are no alives in the main text and the verbs that are available show up in a clean list down here. It's a little less fancy looking and it will feel like a loss of feature from this, but it's, I wanna get everything synchronizing and working together right now is more important. And the ability to add in exceptional interfaces like this um, is, uh, is something I want to do to, to, to address like as a later thing. This would be like, It'd be like trying to build a platformer and while your game physics are still not good, you are trying to figure out how to, like, well, you still can't make the player jump and you want the initial scene to involve climbing a ladder, even though that's not going to be a main theme of the game until way later or something. It's only going to show up a couple of times, but you insist on keeping the ladder in there, even though it's making it harder to figure out the rest of your physics that is going to be the main part of your gameplay, right? That's what this is like. So what I'm going to do is make a move away from this special case and try to build up the general pattern of there's text that you see and there is a list of verbs underneath that are generated automatically, systematically. With the graph interpreter thing. Um, however, I have been streaming for about three and a half hours and it's getting it's getting hungry uh, around here. So I'm thinking maybe t today's been a good stream and I will wrap it up. Um, I will wrap it up here and go get myself some food and then uh, maybe stream this again next week and see how far I've gotten in the intermediate or in the intervening time. So if you've been hanging out and enjoying it, thanks for thanks for being around. You can. Uh, you can go and check out all of my projects on mrforth.com if you haven't seen this before. You can sign up for the newsletter and I will update uh, at most like once a month um, about like uh, what projects I'm doing. You can also get updates on my podcast there uh, when I have new episodes come out and then you can you know adjust what features you wanna get uh, in your inbox. And you can check out other projects that I've done in the past that are out and uh, like that you can see see the results and stuff like that. So that that is it for today. Um, see y'all later. Bye bye.